It was a cool morning, and the gentle mist that floated over the garden was an eerie, haunting beauty to behold. The faintest light of day gave an otherworldly glow to the ground and forest. The great pagoda behind me was casting its shadow over this dim glow and allowing the last few waking fireflies a few more moments of bliss to enjoy before the dawn. The silk kimono I wore felt light and almost weightless, and once or twice I felt my own body to remind myself I even wore clothes. I had on my hakama over that which felt a little heavier and bulkier, but I'd grown used to this feeling by now. My old clothing of denim jeans and a t-shirt had long been lost to me, and frankly, I felt little attachment to them anymore. I glanced to the eastern cobblestone pathway and slipped on my sandals, waiting for me at the wooden step. I walked quietly and observantly down the path, the crisp morning air greeting me with its inescapable embrace. My stomach growled softly and I hushed with force of will alone. I was hungry, but hunger alone would not control me, not this morning especially, for I was going to a private meeting with him. As I climbed the pathway leading up a small slope, large rocks were formed to make a natural edge to the path like miniature walk rock walls to ensure you knew the path. And on the other side was mossy rock and grown grass with bamboo shoots sliding gently up and poking beneath bonsai trees. Every aspect of this garden was kept to perfection, and not one shoot was out of place. It was like walking through a tapestry. And beyond the path was a small flat clearing, only about 20 meters in diameter. And beyond that was a steep slope that went down into the forest below. I'd been here a few times to rest or to get away from the daily routine I'd found myself in since arriving in Owari, but now I would not be here alone, and that thought gave me a strange sense of comfort. And it was there I saw him. Sitting in his own kimono and hakama, his back was straight as an arrow, and his black hair was tied neatly back into a sharp knot. He had a small beard and mustache that was cleanly kept and prominent on his face, and while only a few inches shorter than me, even being a few feet away from him was intimidating. I felt a wave of destructive but controlled power that ebbed off of each slight movement of his body as he reached for the round green cup in front of him, raising it slowly to his lips and sipping the warm tea within. And as I took another tentative step forward, he lowered his cup and turned his head just slightly to acknowledge me. Thank you for coming, Karas, he said with a quiet voice. His voice need not be loud to be heard, his very glance spoke for him. I bowed my head at the name he'd given. Karas was, of course, not my real name, but my real name was too difficult to pronounce in this land, so they'd given me this title to better address me. The man moved his hand to indicate a spot next to him set aside. A small seat waited for me and I bowed again, approaching. I sat down next to this man and then looked him in the face. What can be said about the Demon King of Japan? You can hear all the stories about Nobunaga and never once come to really appreciate who he was. His eyes were a deep brown that seemed to almost look black, but look hard enough at them and you'd see there's a fierce fire behind those eyes, burning fiercely. His face is hard and chiseled with years of experience in both war and in diplomacy. You find yourself most inadequate when you appear next to him. Nobunaga simply looked on at the horizon beyond the slope, his hand resting on his knee and his other on the cup of tea. Woman, are you not aware that my guest has come? Nobunaga did not look to the woman kneeling on the ground to his left, but the smile on his face betrayed the bluntness of his words. The lady no, Nobunaga's wife bowed her head to the floor, her white and blue kimono delicate and lovely like her own features. Her long black hair was tied back into the traditional style I'd seen wives and women of samurai households wear. My apologies, my lord. I shall serve him chat once. Lady No climbed to her feet and shuffled over to me with the daintiest and softest of movements as she poured Shaw into another cup at my feet. Nobunaga simply closed his eyes and waited for her to finish her work. I watched the tea fill my cup and then bowed my head to her. Thank you. It is my honor, Shirley. She returned the bow, though it was deeper than my own. Now leave us, Uda snapped firmly, though his, uh, though his words were not meant to hurt, only to hasten. I had heard him speak to the lady no in this manner before. She smiled at him and kowtowed once more before shuffling away. And ensure we are not disturbed. 
as you wish. She then turned and left, leaving Nobunaga and I alone on the slope, gazing out at the slow rising sun. What do you make of her? Nobunaga asked. She is beautiful, my lord, I said honestly. Even a fool could provide such an answer, Nobunaga countered grimly, and you are no fool. Tell me truthfully. I smirked. Nobunaga had this way of getting the point out in an instant, and he didn't abide lazy or half-hearted resolve in anything, even an answer to a simple question. She is shrewd and incredibly intelligent, sir. She is a strong and beautiful creature, to be sure. It is evident that you and her are quite similar. This answer seemed to please Nobunaga better than my previous one. I think she's an ideal wife and woman to you, if I may be so bold. It is not too bold to say this, Nobunaga answered. I am blessed by her presence, he answered softly, turning his eyes back to the sun. But she is a woman, and like all women, she is endlessly curious. Is it so wrong for a woman to be curious? I asked, intrigued. Nobunaga shook his head. No, he answered. Normally, it is even charming for a woman to ask questions and be intrigued by the world and goings-on of men. But when the woman is strong-hearted as she is, then, there is, then their curiosity can match with fierce intensity. If I say to her, these things are not for you to know, she will persist in asking until I cave to her. <laughs> it is a shame she was not born a man. There would be no fiercer samurai in all Japan. I laughed at the joke, and Nobunaga smiled, never once glancing at me. His gaze was only reserved for the proper moments. I'm glad she was not here to hear you say that. I'm sure she would not have appreciated it. He lifted his teacup to his lips and sighed. But of course, I did not invite you to enjoy the sunrise with me, to discuss my wife. He fell silent, setting down his cup, and I felt a sense of awkwardness wash over me. Uncertain of what to say as the dim dark of the morning was being slowly melted by the sun, peaking on the bank of the horizon. How long have you been in my service now? He asked. Almost ten years, I answered, amazed at how long it had been. It feels like the time has gone by so quickly. Life is the blinking of an eye, Nobunaga explained. The sun rises and sets in a mere breath, which is why it is vital to savor each and every moment of it. You have proven a valuable asset, but more than this, you are my ally. The word struck me with a weight I'd not expected, and I felt myself tense up with disbelief. Nobunaga finally turned his eyes to me, and I felt like I could collapse into a fit of tears at the look of warm recognition. I don't deserve that praise from you, but you do, he corrected. It is a leader's greatest error to overlook the efforts and merits of his subjects and servants and not reward them for them. It is high time you were thus. You will be my vassal and personal guard, as of this moment. My very soul felt like it would fly. I dared to drop to my knees and bow my head to the ground before Nobunaga in gratitude. I'm speechless. You have no need for words. Your actions and your resolve are impressive. In fact, I discussed the idea with Lord Tokugawa. Lord Tokugawa agreed to this? I asked, surprised. Tokugawa Ieyasu was a friend of Nobunaga and fellow daimyo who had fought beside him loyally for the past several years. I'd met him only a few times, but he was every bit the man I'd expected him to be and more. He didn't agree. He recommended it heartily. For a foreigner, you're a fascinating young man. I bowed my head again to Nobunaga. The sun was now peering over the mountain ranges, and we were both basked in its beauty. For the longest time, neither of us spoke as the sun rose to greet us as a master and servant. The glory of the light basked in the land and its power, and the dark fled to shadows and hiding. Heat washed over the fog and dissipated it to nothing. The morning had come and greeted us at last. I was now a vassal, a Hatamoto of Lord Nobunaga, the man I'd studied for years before appearing in this time and land, and now... I was watching a sunrise beside him, enjoying our newfound kinship and friendship. I would dance if I could, but I refrained. Nobunaga merely smiled and watched the sun come up, with a stoicism that comes from aristocracy and valor. But a haunting feeling began to build in my soul, something I knew was waiting behind his throat. 
How gorgeous, he whispered. You told me that in your time our country is called the Land of the Rising Sun. It is a more fitting name for this land than any other. For this I am grateful for the future. How beautiful it must be. Yes, I was right. But, sire, I had to tell him. I wanted to disclose the secret I'd held in my heart for the last ten years. I'd known it when I first met him, but never told him. Because how could I? But now, being named his friend, his Hatamoto, how could I withhold it now? It is my solemn hope that in your time, this land, no matter how it changes, never loses the appreciation for and glory of moments such as these. Nobunaga sighed as the moment gradually faded. I then turned to him, desperate to speak, but Nobunaga spoke first. I will go over the details of your new station and land when I turn from my trip. Hideyoshi has informed me that he requires reinforcements in his seas against the Mori. I will join him after I pay a visit to Honoji Temple in Kyoto. My heart froze in my chest and I suddenly realized the year, the day, the period. How could I have forgotten? I had to tell him. I had to tell Nobunaga the truth. Lord Nobunaga, I cried, falling to my knees before him and pleading in fear. My lord, I I must tell you this. No matter what comes, I must tell you what waits a Karasu-san. I stopped instantly when Nobunaga snapped. He gave me a dangerous but understanding glare that warned my voice to remain locked away. Do not forget the vow you made to me when you told me you were of the future. Sire, I, I have no desire to know my future, he answered. You told me before that for me to know it would greatly endanger the future. Even if that were not the case, I have no interest in knowing it. Lord Oda, I... Please, I have to, even if it is to my own detriment, I forbid you from disclosing a word of my future to me. Oda warned, and I lowered my face to hide it from him, so he could not see the tears. My friend, the future is a path we must forge for ourselves. It is not a map by which we are to be guided, but a road we are always marching and constructing along the way. Where is the enjoyment of life and death that if, if it is always exposed to us? I bit my lip, but nodded my head to him. I again hid the knowledge I held. Forgive me. I'm sorry, I... Nobunaga smiled and placed a hand on my shoulder. Do you think I'm a fool? No, no, of course not. That is what some believe. That I am the fool of Owari. That I am too odd or strange-minded. That's what they called me before I began my conquest. Do you believe this to be so? Sire, you are a better man than any I've met in this time or mine, I assured him. Nobunaga laughed at this and shook his head. Were flattery a weapon, I'm sure you could kill a kami, he chuckled. Never mind the kind words, I would prefer your honesty. In truth, I know that my desire for secrecy is somewhat selfish and definitely foolish. But it is how I desire my life. I live to see the future in my own time and in its own way. Let me enjoy my life the way I see it, not how you already have. I nodded slowly, resigning myself back to the silence to which I'd sworn. Sit a little while longer. I felt him draw I felt him draw me to my feet with his mere voice alone, and I stood, returning to my seat again, and watching the now beautiful dawn sky grow further and further into its unchallenging brightness. Whatever becomes of your time, mine, or this nation's, make the most of the moment you are given. You were brought to this time and to this hour so we might share in this sunrise. Let us make good of it. And so I sat beside the man I had admired and served, tears in my eyes and pain in my heart. I would cling to this hour and to this sunrise for the rest of my life, as the day that I had tea with Oda Nobunaga, the fool of Owari, one of the great unifiers of Japan, and now a friend.